they can sense like they say if you if a shark encounters you stay there don't try to swim away stay there next to the shark because invariably what happens seals and the turtles are the uh, food of sharks when a diver when a person swimming on surface and a diver is diving underwater the silhouette is like uh, those animals so a shark cannot differentiate that's why and if it's hungry the shark is hungry it will go and attack we suddenly switched on the tv at around 9 o'clock we found there some something happening in taj and something happened in sayan hospital and also in the in the bt station 12:30 at night they reached mumbai and taj there was a lot of chaos there and the team were told to enter so we had we follow a buddy pair so one guy went in the second guy was outside and the other five six people are lined up behind he heard a cocking of ak47 and he realized ki now they are under grief we were using mp5s so there's a distinct noise of mp5 cocking and ak47 cocking and then there was a volley of fire from the other side Commodore Vijay Pal Rawat is one of the most intense human beings we've had on this show. When you first meet him, you won't be able to tell he's intense. You can definitely tell that he's a military veteran because of the way he carries himself, because of the way he stands. But very few people will be able to tell that he's considered to be one of the legends of the world of the Marcos, the Marcos or the Marine Commandos. are the special forces of the indian navy they were built in order to carry out extremely difficult operations that the regular military personnel may not be able to do with ease the kind of adventures that the marcos have the kind of missions that they built for that's what this episode is about today so while we began the episode speaking a little bit about the navy Trust me, it becomes one of the most adventurous episodes that we've ever created as the episode moves forward. If you're fascinated by the Para SF, which is the Special Forces of the Indian Army, you're in for a ride when it comes to this episode. The Marcos is a concept, is a vertical of the Indian military that more people need to know of. From an international perspective, everyone knows about the Navy SEALs, but very few people know. that one of the most badass sections of the armed forces anywhere in the world are the indian marcos and here we have a legend of the indian marcos with us commodore vijay rawat is on trs make sure you follow trs on spotify we're a spotify exclusive every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world vijay sir thank you for being on the show to the audience i'll let you slip into one of the most iconic trs episodes that we've created in recent times jai hind commodore vijay rawat sir uh excited oh very excited i'm excited <laughs> i i was just talking on behalf of myself but yeah. i'm glad to know that you're excited uh you know when someone meets you in real life and i'm going to be very straight forward here but when someone meets you in real life i don't think they know what kind of a badass you are and <laughs> what kind of a tough human being you are because yeah. your vibe is too friendly and approachable yeah thanks a lot <laughs> yeah but it's kind of like a whole peter parker spider man situation yeah, like yeah absolutely right but you know it tells my wife once a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a peter parker sitting in front of us who can easily jump up on the roof and start crawling and become a spider man <laughs> thank you thanks for this <laughs> accolades <laughs> my god sir i can't tell you how collectively excited the team is to do a marcos themed uh, episode We've done so many armed forces episodes. We've had Marcos based conversations come up in the past episodes, okay. and we sat on the edit table and removed it because the internal conversation was when Vijay sir comes. That's when we'll actually do an all-out Marcos based conversation. So okay. not one data point of Marcos should go out from anyone other than you. Okay. Uh, so that's what this episode is. So anyway, once again, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think honestly people know what. Marcos is really people have just started to even understand special forces in general yeah. because there's not much data about the armed forces out there in the public domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, often people's understanding of the armed forces comes from movies like Sher Shah or Border. Yeah. But this is the real method in which it should come out. We also have international audiences, sir. Yeah. So I'd love for you to kind of introduce what Marcos is to both international audiences okay. as well as Indian citizens listening in. Yeah, my pleasure actually. see uh, every service uh, in the armed forces have got a special forces element 
so the special forces element for the navy is the marine commandos it was uh, it was actually commissioned earlier as the indian marine special force but later on the name was changed to marine commandos so it does confuse with uh, royal marine commando which is not so because it is a special force like they have the sbs or we have the you know delta force or we have seal team 6 i think SEALs. i think you might have to explain the term special forces also. okay i will tell you see what happens you know like you have a normally uh, a normal soldier in the armed forces is trained to a certain level of combat and based on his level of knowledge and training and skill sets he is able to do some kind of operations but then if you have to upscale his uh, skills and you know make him uh, a combatant who can do much beyond uh, what an infantry soldier can do and let me also tell you here that infantry indian infantry soldiers are par excellence they are yep. actually very good mm-hmm. but amongst them if you want to find the best people and then they have to train them uh, to become special forces that it requires different kind of steel you know nerves of steel it can require different kind of your uh, combination of brawn and brain so what happens uh, in the special forces you find guys uh, who are uh, who are mentally very tough physically robust and uh, they have a natural instinct for uh, uh, you know uh, uh, doing situational awareness and orientation towards any situation which is developing which for a normal soldier may actually unsettle him but for a special forces guy definitely that's the way uh, the training uh, level is so high that it sort of becomes like a muscle memory and so this is the second thing is that a special forces comprised of the best people we have in the armed forces number 2 they got the best weapons and equipment number 3 they got the best platform for launch and recovery for launch and recovery means when you are launch team i am talking about the marine commandos because there are a lot of launch uh, amongst among the three services marine commandos are the only force which actually operate in three dimensions we uh, use the air medium for doing insertion by sky diving by para jumping wind bus slithering and rappling then we use uh, then we use the sea medium for uh, doing you know using your Uh, ribs for rigid hull inflatable fast boats what we what also, is that it's basically a, a fast boat which uh, has a speed of 40 knots plus it can carry about 16 people okay. 40 knots transfers about almost 35 kilometers per hour which is a very high speed and it is meant for quick insertion and extraction from a particular target area after you achieved the mission so that is one way we can use it the same rib can also be air dropped from a c130 or c17 and then we do a follow up with a sky dive mm. and then you know the rib falls into the water we sky dive there next to the rib and within one and a half minute we are into the rib and then we go for an operation you say it so casually with so much humility <laughs> in your eyes again like people don't understand the dangers involved people no, don't don't understand the difficulty involved i'm feeling very bad about it because i've retired and you know this is you know the fun thing of my youngsters to do because by the time all this capability got into the service i had just was over the over the curve and i wasn't able to do all those things but you know at least i've ensured that this capability has now been made available to us so today if you look at from the equipment point of view we are at par with uh, perhaps the best uh, maritime special forces in the world including the us navy seals mm and so that is one so this is another medium a third medium is underwater medium underwater medium is basically you know we got a two man craft called the chariot craft which has about uh, you know 100 uh, kilo of tnt slung under it and you also carry limpid mines which are about 7 kilos and 15 kilos there are two people who sit on the chariot craft and one is a pilot and the pilot console is something very similar to a helicopter console but a very very uh, narrow down version you got a gyro you got a depth uh, uh, meter you got a echo sounder you got a forward echo sounder and you you got uh, a pitch indicator and uh, battery indicators and all this kind of stuff and then and it's a free flooding compartment that means mm. the water is coming from all around you are actually in the water medium you are wearing a diving set a closed circuit diving set and a closed circuit diving set is normally used when you have 100% oxygen in a bottle Okay. and then when you uh, breathe in and you exhale the exhale air doesn't go out because if it goes out bubbles are formed and somebody can make out that there's somebody underwater <laughs> so this one uh, when the bubble comes it bubble doesn't come the exhaled air goes into the uh, co2 absorbent which is in a canister in the diving set and that actually converts it into oxygen again wow so then uh, that's how it is you so the endurance there's also got a rebreather set and the endurance of the set is about 2 to 3 hours what about the endurance of the people wearing endurance it endurance of the people you know that's the issue because normally that's the reason why uh, we de- do so much of training for the marine commando especially in water because the water is not a very easy medium it doesn't spare you so easily if you get tired in land you can actually stop but if you get tired in water then you'll be in grief you know why i love military podcasts yeah. because you give me so many tangents to go on <laughs> it doesn't happen with other human beings uh but so okay let me let me ask you uh, this why are all special forces yeah why are they so like humble like 
I feel like that's also a definite part of the human element of special forces. And the one thing I've understood is that there is a very strong human element. Like while you're putting these high quality soldiers through some sort of training, you are also putting them through some sort of mental conditioning to almost make them better human beings or to make them more humble. Am I correct in saying that? Actually, absolutely you're correct. But you know, how do I put this so that, you know, the viewers can actually easily understand. You know, when a baby is born, he's actually raw. And uh, he doesn't know anything. So for him, everything is natural, comes naturally to him and then he imbibes and picks up things. In the, Mar I, I, I've done uh, Marine Commando training. I've done Infantry uh, Commando School Belgaum training, which is a very tough training of 33 days. I've also done uh, the course, little bit of course with NSG. Before that, I did the, my clearance diving course, which is basically, uh, it's quite a difficult course. It's about eight months course, which happens in Cochin, diving school Cochin. See, in all these courses, the emphasis is on making you raw getting you down to your knees, getting you to the, you know, they say you're the biggest scum in the earth and you don't, you uh, know, you, you, you don't exist in the earth. And if you want to survive, then you have to prove it. So what happens, they get you down to such an extent that, uh, that, you know, your mind stops working. Your mind stops working and you become like a baby. Mm. So I, I, I assume that humility comes from there. Yeah, one second, when you said become like a baby, you mean you go to a very primal level you in your You go to a very primal level. You okay. do, you'd go to a very primal level of survival and, you know, like, uh, just imagine, uh, you, your day start, I'm saying the uh, clearance, dive, clearance diving course. Clearance diving because we, we clear uh, mines underwater. So you'll have to kind of explain the educational trajectory as well. Okay. So like I'll just people have no context. Okay. Yeah. So like you have normal bombs which are thrown, uh, dropped by the aircrafts and they are meant to explode and create the kind of destruction. Similarly, you have sea mines which are laid underwater just to destroy some ships which are passing over it. So you have a sea mine which is laid underwater to a depth of let's say 20, 30, 40 meters by various mediums. You can throw it from an aircraft, you can throw it from a craft of opportunity or you can throw it to get a submarine and to lay the sea mines. Idea is to stop uh, the own shipping, to disturb the own shipping and also to stop your own warships trying to trouble them. So this is uh, this kind of uh, mining operation which happens. So the clearance diving team is, uh, is comprised of a team of divers, clearance divers who are trained to do underwater disposal of uh, the sea mines, which is a very high risk kind of activity. Because it's like uh, bomb it's diffusing, like a bomb, but yeah. underwater. But when you diffuse a bomb on surface, I've done that course also. I also qualified in uh, improvised explosive devices, uh, you know, disposal and also making it. So now what happens underwater, as I told you, uh, it's not as simple as what you do on the surface. Uh, there is an issue of equipment. There is an issue of, you know, stabilizing yourself. And uh, there is a limited amount of people who can actually address one mine underwater. Mines actually sink into the mud and, you know, sometimes you really keep on digging to find where the mine is. And the Indian waters are such that, you know, sometimes the mine goes to about two, three meters. You really can't actually, when you say two, three meters under the bottom becomes Gosh. clay or mud. It just goes, sinks inside. So how do, how the hell do you find out? And then the, these are the mines who got, uh, they can get activated by either a pressure indu uh, uh, induced uh, uh, this activation or by noise activation or even by metallic uh, changes of any uh, magnetism because they are actually meant for ships. So when a ship is moving, there is the ambient noise within the ship, internal noise of the ship. There is also the noise of the propellers and there is also uh, the metal, the huge metal about uh, four to 5,000 tons of metal moving over the water. Mm. So it is going to have some kind of magnetic uh, disturbances, which is picked up by a mine. It just explodes. And if you have one or two mines which explode under a ship, then probably the ship will be in grief. It actually can sink. So our job is to ensure that once you detect a mine, our job of a, as a clearance driver is to go underwater with your equipment and try to identify the mine and try to diffuse the mine. One little rookie question. Yeah. Very city boy question for you. Uh, you said it's like 20 to 30 meters deep. Yeah. I've done a 36 uh, foot dive, I believe. And yeah. it was like significantly. That's about 10, 11 meters. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't imagine how deep these mines are placed. And also I can't imagine the force with which those bombs explode yeah. to be able to take out a ship that's on the Actually, surface. Actually, there's a water plume effect, you know. It, it explodes underwater and the water plume comes up. Okay. It's like the a torpedo. Is, yeah, exactly. When you, when, it, when even a bomb actually on surface explodes, it has got the pressure effect. It's got the waves, pressure which is coming and the sound and of course the sharpness. Underwater sharpness will not have much of a relevance, but uh, the pressure of the explosion of the TNT, it could be 300 kg, 200 kg TNT. TNT is explosive. Yeah, yeah. You could have various other kinds of explosive. And that explodes. And uh, then uh, there's a water, the column of water above the, uh, above the mine, that actually comes up. Gotcha. And then that's called the water plume. The water plume is very dangerous. 
it's and like a hydro actually, cannon yeah hydro cannon and it can actually is like a water jet and it can actually break a ship's hull into two parts let's get into naval warfare a yeah. little bit i don't even know where to begin this conversation <laughs> honestly but what i would also like to kind of give you context on is that yeah. when it comes to the subject of hot war where humans go up against other humans yeah. lots of people visualize the army you know yeah. like fighting against like soldiers fighting against yeah. each other um has there been a recent sort of violent hot war history of, of naval war for anywhere in the world see it's like this that uh, all the greatest powers of the world have become great because of among the three services one service very predominant which is the uh, which is the navy mm. you see the the royal navy the british navy most of the other uh, you know people who uh, who set up colonies were all u- using their ships for all the movements and so basically the navy was the one in the forefront all the expedition they had from the ships only but, today but, the us navy has got a preponderance of force because they got 11 uh, aircraft nuclear aircraft carriers each aircraft carrier can carry about 90 aircrafts can you imagine together they are bigger than most of the uh, you know uh, air forces of the world mm. are there a lot of naval warfare situations that happen all over the globe which are not reported by media so what happens most of the countries cannot afford to have a full fledged war because mm. it takes their economy down by a couple of years you know if china is a is a emerging power in fact is the second largest economy in the world and uh, they really want to become the world power but then to become the world power they start uh, they should not start doing all this kind of activity in the world they should not do things because it is going to affect their economy is going to affect their business interest it diplomatically is going to have a beating they are going to take a beating so all these things are there uh, so uh, everybody wants to have a, a a little bit of conflict you know and keep it bis- below the escalation matrix mm. that means you start something but ensure that it is so calibrated that it doesn't go you know conflagrate to a full fledged warfare gotcha same thing happened in india in india pakistan if you see uh, kargil the same thing we didn't want to cross the loc and go that side because we could have easily done that and but then we didn't want to do it because we have got we are a principled country you know we didn't want to uh, unnecessarily escalate when it comes to naval warfare if you fire a missile or a torpedo it hits the target the target sinks and we talking about targets like a ship a ship will sink with 200 people on board and of course the cost of the any normal warship a frigate class will cost you about 8 to 10000 crores so that's the amount of damage plus the psychological damage so uh, that's why navy doesn't get involved in very small time skirmishes navy gets involved in something called a limo low intensity maritime operations that is you know people do gun running they do human trafficking they do some kind of you know piracy operations and all these small small operations they the navy during peace time they do it that's fine but you know uh, i think after the uh, uh, after the uh, uh, israel uh, egypt war which was which saw the missile actions there has been no significant uh, action only now in ukraine you found one of the one of the you know uh, warship was sunk can i pitch a geopolitical concept to you and this is from my understanding from the show please yeah. correct me from wrong yeah. is it true that if you control the seas yeah. it is extremely beneficial to your economy and therefore your geopolitical power in the world and is that the reason why the navy is so key to geopolitical power 100% see actually when uh, our prime minister late prime minister nehru he said you know uh, though if you control the sea if you control the sea you actually can influence uh, uh, issues on the land and is it because the seas provide food like is that the reason not only food actually see nine if you come to the world trade almost 90% of the world trade moves by sea trading what trading in crude oil trading in petroleum products trading in coal uh, minerals everything you know is being carried from one country to the other uh, import export all those things happen so they are carrying the trade now coming back to india 90 uh, 90% by volume and 97% by cost that must trade happens through the sea route so now that's why to ensure that our sea lines of communication that is the shipping is not disturbed by inimical uh, elements even by uh, other navies and other rogue elements uh, we need to have a strong navy and not only strong navy we should need, we need to have a navy which can actually react immediately that's why again as uh, i really cannot uh, reveal much about uh, the deployments of our ships but i can just tell you that two years back there were more than uh, 150 warships of foreign countries deployed in the indian ocean region uh, uh, itself and there were about more than 51 ships from the us navy which are deployed at any point in time in the indian ocean region what is the business here the business here is to ensure that the business runs without uh, the uh, preponderance of force that to a naval force which can actually dominate that area control the seas and ensure that there is a smooth flow of traffic uh, of uh, the trade they have to be there 
like how they say wars are one or lost based on logistics so this is the economic version of it in so, terms of yeah. the economy of countries is heavily dependent on on mercantile mag- marine and econ- you guys protect the merchant navy yes we have to ensure that our sea borders are protected we have to ensure that our uh, the sea which come under uh, indian jurisdiction are not exploited by the other powers gotcha until the uh, economic you know exclusive economic zone and uh, beyond that is the high seas but within that uh, they should be protected and uh, uh, and then third you have to ensure that our uh, energy security that means you know petroleum products and you know gas products all this which are coming by tankers and all these things one or two million barrels of oil is required every day in india to sustain the economy mm. so every country has got something called a strategic oil reserves i may be wrong with my figure sure. so but that's not of much interest to the general public it's just to uh, suffice to say that a lot of oil is required by the country to run the economy on a daily basis so what countries do is that they develop something called a strategic uh, oil reserves if you don't have strategic oil reserves obviously you will come to a grinding halt you cannot run your aircraft you cannot move, fly your aircraft you can't run your tanks you cannot move your ships and then nothing can happen you as as good as surrendering while being in harbor one know about naval warfare sir yeah um in like i've i've kind of again got so many places to go with this how do you even explain naval warfare to someone who doesn't really understand it because um i mean i'm sure there's deep levels of strategy maneuvering the ship uh you know the way you would use the weapons how do you even explain it actually you know when people talk about warfare i don't think people even understand what is army warfare what they see now in the news media is you know they watch a movie called border and they know that line of control is there and there are firing going on from here firing going from there they need to artillery firing they do artillery firing this is not warfare actually this is not this is very simple you know the lowest uh, level of warfare mm. then what they understand is you know you see you know people having uh, problems not problems people uh, getting into encounter in jnk and even the northeast against terrorists and all so people understand this because they see people in you know uh, camouflage uniform from the army and also from the other security forces and they doing this kind of anti terrorist operations i think uh, the general public feels that that is what is army warfare that's not so in fact that is one of, that is actually police role actually mm. army is not meant for that mm. but when one of the duties of our, our army is to when they are called upon to do internal security so they do it and that's why we are doing it because they're the most organized force and the most well trained force that's why they are deployed for this kind of operations yeah. otherwise this is not uh, the only this is one of the smallest spec of uh, army operations mm. even the army operations are very very high tech in the sense that not only high tech in terms of the equipment they use but also the thought process the strategies they make uh, the kind of to further progress with the operations so it's complicated by itself coming to the air force operation no one understand they all know balo coat strike and that's about it that is one small part of the air force operation i mean if that was so in indian air force doesn't have to be the fifth largest or fourth largest air force in the world we got about 800 aircraft in our uh, in our kitty then coming to the naval operations obviously as compared to these two they are more visible because they are in land but any warfare at sea is something which people don't come to know about it because it is not so apparent and we don't operate in small scales naval warfare is always in large scale and large scale means war so that's the reason but if i want to sum, uh, summarize what uh, what uh, you want me to convey to the people who are watching there are two concepts of naval warfare one is called the sea control and one is called the sea denial sea control is the medium of the sea which you are actually controlling effectively that means when a aircraft carrier goes it doesn't go alone it goes along with a tanker to fuel it it goes along with other escort ships which could be destroyers which could be frigates now destroyer and frigates are warships and of course the destroyers are slightly bigger than the frigates and they got missiles they got you know surface to surface missile to destroy the enemy ships they got surface to air missile to ensure that uh, any any may aircraft or missile which is coming is destroyed so they and they are put in various uh, you know various areas uh, you know there are various formations and formation also got a calculation so i don't want to bore people with that no no i, I don't so think are, anyone's getting so bored so there are a lot of calculations and then the calculations are based on tactical situation and also the capability of the sensors on board sensors sonar sensors your other electronic warfare sensors your radar sensors and of course the range of your missiles so all this thing you so you have in the center you have the main body and on the sides protect the main body and also going to progress with the operation you have the other vessels mm. now once you have that it is said that when the us cbg carrier battle group is moving around it sanitizes an area of 1000 kilometers around it so that is called sea control means anything which moves in 1000 kilometers can be prosecuted mm. and positively identified and destroyed 
so people are scared so when he moves to an area that whole area wo dada ban gaya that he becomes the boss of the area indian navy has got a capability of more than 500 km 600 km uh, to control the entire area so that's called sea control then there is something so when you have sea control then you, any of a trade can pass through it easily no other uh, you know uh, uh, enemy warship can actually tamper with it mm. because you are having a sea control now second uh, concept is sea denial sea denial means you deny the water body above you in a particular area to the enemy to use it or his enemy shipping to use it like make and it a red zone of sorts like red zone of sort and that's not uh, and the sea denial the best platform is a submarine so when you have a submarine or nuclear submarine lurking underwater <laughs> it is the biggest threat uh, because you know the biggest threat why because it is very difficult to detect a submarine underwater because you have something called as sonar sonar actually you know sound uh, navigation ranging so you actually uh, actually emit some sound the sound goes and touches the object and comes back and then with that you can make out whether it's a you can it's a, it's a false target or it's actually a submarine or what is the size of submarine all those kind of stuff you can stuff. draw out a picture of what's under you you can draw out a picture under you the problem is that the propagation of sound underwater is very complicated there is something called as the condition condition of you know what how saline the water is how cold or hot the water is what are the uh, you know uh, what is the uh, all these called the bathy conditions you know okay and then uh, so uh, <laughs> it's it's slightly complicated so generally what happens a sonar uh, of a, sh- a warship sonar uh, may not pick up a submarine but a submarine sonar can pick up the warship because he stays in passive hmm. passive mode he can actually listen to the propeller noise he can listen to the emit noise of a, of his ship and if he's transporting through in sonar he can actually pick up hmm. because he is in a better position gotcha and he can pick up and then he can comes and takes up a position a proper and fires a torpedo if a torpedo hits a vessel then the vessel doesn't survive that is the potency of a torpedo and that is why uh, submarines are the most potent platform and the most effective platform for doing a sea denial so when you say my submarines are deployed here the other way of sea denial is put mines sea mines i just explained so you put sea mines and you say that or you can declare a minefield mm. as per the geneva convention if you mine a particular area you have to declare to everybody in the world because uh, unlike uh, a border issue where you got people on this side and that side there's a demarcation is like football match mm. you have you know this side and that side the villages on this side are actually pulled back and similarly on the other side sea is a uh, is a global common in the sense ki everybody moves around the sea is the data shared with all of the world's navies uh not all the world's navy data is shared we got a we got an organization in indian navy where Uh, almost all the data of the shipping both indian shipping merchant vessels or most of the countries it it paints you know they're exactly position gotcha. last port of call what they are carrying passenger crew list and next port of call where it is going everything is recorded so we generally know exactly where our ships are where they are any one of them who who doesn't identify we can make out that this is not this maybe an enemy thing do you think that there's a lot of animals down there which are not discovered also as far as i am concerned being a clearance diver and being a marine commando i have encountered jellyfish underwater i've seen a lot of fishes i have uh, grouper is one uh, grouper is one fish i've seen i've seen uh, uh, you know moray eel i've seen uh, sea turtles i've seen a lot of other colored fish sharks sharks i've seen smaller ones not a bigger ones okay. uh, when you especially when you dive in the andaman nicobar islands i've uh, and also the basic reefs if you see uh, where there we find and of course sea snakes mm. uh, what what's the animal that you are the most wary of when it's near actually looks wise it is uh, the moray eel because it looks deadly it looks like a reptile on underwater and it can actually confuse with uh, let's say a crocodile or something because you also have sea, sea crocodiles and in the andaman nicobar islands there was a time when there was uh, salty salt 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 water actually sea uh, crocodiles uh and, and they are significantly larger than land crocodiles right uh, as far as i know like i think th- any they dangerous animals they are dangerous am- animals and of course they hunt for food uh the sea snakes are the deadliest snakes in the world but the the beauty is that uh, there are very very few known cases of a sea snake bite death because you see indian fishermen they actually remove the sea snakes from the nets and just chuck it back to the <laughs> into the water because they got small beaks and they are very shy they don't actually bite but if they bite somebody then the guy is gone because there is no antidote for that Have you had interactions with crocodiles? Uh, not with crocodiles, but I had close uh, shares with uh, with uh, moray eel and also with uh, the you know 
Portuguese man of war, which is basically a jellyfish. Okay. And jellyfish are actually dangerous because they got its tentacles, and these tentacles have got you know small, small uh, a pin sort of thing, which actually is like acts act like an injection, and they can inject poison into your body. And you've been stung? I've been stung, and uh, it was it's quite dangerous because uh, I was stung in when I was in part of the Operation Pawan. We were deployed in Trincomalee Harbour, and all the naval warships used to come, and our job was to go underwater, search for any mines and all. Because the easiest way to have maximum casualties to put a sea a small limpid mine under a war vessel, and when the and and time it to a couple of hours when the ship is sailing with six hundred passengers or soldiers, it just blasts and the ship goes down. So we used to ensure that before a ship comes alongside, we used to dive on the jetty and see is there any mine-like object or mine. If it is there, then we have to dispose it off. Similarly, also on the on board a ship, every two three hours we used to come and do diving. Mm. Now the waters are very clear in Trincomalee Harbour. You can actually throw a coin and see the coin at 20, 30 meters depth. Wow! Is that clear? It's as clear as Lakshadweep Islands. Okay. And they are one of the good dive, dive spots. So there we used to see, you know, uh, a bunch of jellyfish with tentacles, you know, actually moving around through two, three meters, extending two, three meters long, and we used to avoid them. But how, how big are they? Like how big is the body? Jellyfish could be about uh, anything from a smaller one to about half a meter to one. I've seen a jellyfish which could be a diameter of one, one and a half meter, more than this light. And then <laughs> this more than this light, and then it comes towards you. It can have tentacles which can be about two three meters, and they are the tentacles are also moving so slowly, you will not realize it. And if you're like in my case, what happened? I was diving, and when I came up, I saw the jellyfish, and I was trying to maneuver myself. But then some of those uh, you know the tentacles got caught my my neck, and my neck was exposed. And uh, that uh, sort of I had high fever for two three days. Do you sense aggression from those? Not aggression. I mean, it is just a uh, know that they are trying to harm us, but it's their domain, their medium. You know, mm. we are trying to interfere in their medium. Mm. It's self protection. Yeah, yeah, self protection. Actually, underwater. What, what did it feel like getting stung? In the neck? See, it was like a burning sensation, and thereafter, it's like uh, it's a poison basically. It's not a very potentially. It cannot cause uh, fatality in uh, in human beings, but it can really make you sick. So I was sick for about four five days. Like it's like a strong bout of viral fever you have, no? Continuous high temperature of 103, 104. It remained for about two three days, and then of course we put soda lime cocktail and all. We put some other kind of uh, you know some kind of uh, lotions and all which our, our medical doctor gave us. Is is it true that human urine is a yes? Okay, and actually sea water is a antiseptic by itself. So if you have any heavy cuts and all, you just go and dive in the sea. It becomes all right. It healing is faster. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, what you said about this uh, urine. Urine has got a lot of benefits. One of the benefit is this, and we do it actually. Mm. And did it actually help? Uh, I didn't put urine. <laughs> urine yeah, but, you know, I'm just saying that people do when uh, there's some cut in the leg and all. You're done. We pee there and. Right. It actually relieves you, you know, because it's hot. It's hot. Mm. Something very hot flowing no, around no. there, and and you get a psychologically, huh? It's going to become all right. Mm. Yeah, that way. Just sharing a very, again, very urban, non-adventurous perspective with you. Yeah. But um, uh, we had a recent uh, trip to Dubai for the sake of YouTube vlogs. Like mm. we were trying to, uh, you know, get some experiences in Dubai Mall has this big aquarium where they allow you to actually dive, dive yeah. with uh, really large sharks on you. At least what is large in my perspective, they would have been at least six, six and a half feet sharks. Uh, they don't really. Come very very close to you, as in they'll swim past you. If you put your hand out, you'll be able to touch them. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's lot of um, what's it called? Uh, not stingrays, but manta rays. Manta rays, yeah. Uh, They are too dangerous. Yeah, which will swim really close to you yeah. in that aquarium, which is very strange for someone like I'm not even a trained manta diver. Manta ray, I've actually encountered, but okay. not in a dangerous manner. I've seen it you know, swimming past us in again Lakshadweep Islands. Yeah. Um. I remember telling my uh, my buddy, who's also my co-founder, we had decided to do this experience. He was very up for it. I was scared because I have this fear of like sharks, hmm. and he said that no, no, let's do it. It'll be a life experience. Once we actually got in, um, so I'm 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 a trained swimmer, and I was very comfortable in the water. And these animals were swimming past, and the energy I sensed from them was honestly a little sad when they were in that aquarium. I think they were very aware about the fact that they're not in the open ocean. Okay. So I sensed like a little. I don't want to say sad energy, but little like oh look at us, we're like you know we're stuck here. It was like kind of like that energy and little lazy, and I confirmed it with a, a European friend of mine who dives actively, and they said that yeah these animals are behaving different from the animals we see out there in the ocean. Yeah. My question to you is, what is the energy and the vibe of like the animals that you encounter? Like, are see, they in their own zones? Are they aggressive? Are they just living life and like exploratory? See, I'm I'm not into research on this subject, but whatever I've read. See, it is very simple. If it is not your food, 
then why will uh, it person try to attack that that animal try to attack you that's number one thing they all are uh, domain specific animals so anybody intrudes it's an intruder an intruder is like a trespasser mm. so obviously the, the, he's threatened more than that that animal is threatened more than you are threatened so now but the third and more important thing is that they can sense whether you are scared or not the electrical impulse of your body impulse, yeah. if, if they can sense like they say if you if a shark encounters you i mean they told this to they used to tell us but you know we used to just feel ki i mean if a shark <laughs> if a shark encounters you you just stay there don't try to swim away stay there next to the shark because invariably what happens uh, seals and the turtles are the uh, food of sharks when a diver when a person swimming on surface and a diver is diving underwater the silhouette is like uh, those animals so a shark cannot differentiate that's why and if it's hungry the shark is hungry it go to attack and it doesn't attack singularly you know it's like you know feeding frenzy is there where more than one shark is there but uh, it is said that uh, any animal if he senses that you are scared it'll try to make you scare more you see this even with city dogs yes you know? people were just afraid of dogs and they kind of act like the dog will actually come up and try to yeah. scare so you so while i'm not a you know uh, analyst psychological analyst of animals but i can i can just relate to what i have read about um, animals in on ground to the same thing underwater have you done that ever have you been in a situation where you had to stare an animal in the eye and just tell the animal to back off but dogs yes in underwater 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 morel yes once it happened you know i mean we did 10 days diving camp so this was one of the encounters we had many more encounters so now we knew that you know if you morel is looking at you you just look at him but not from very close and we are not adventure seekers you know we are doing our own business we are actually doing training and so it's invariably seen that uh, when you lock your eyes with the other person or with an animal uh, there is some amount of stillness and uh, then as you see in lot of uh, national geographic also the shark will swim out some way or something will swim away so i my experience is only one but i think uh, it does play a role your psychological uh, things does play a role you need to tell the animal who the predator is who the predator is or oh, you have to tell the animal look i am actually i i'm not in any way trying to harm you something like that oh. what's the biggest thing you saw underwater the biggest thing i saw underwater is uh, manta ray okay manta ray was pretty big the tail was very long i i thought manta rays are playful but they're not why did you think they play for i because you know actually uh, it's psychological you know manta ray the the design of the, i mean the way it is shaped i feel like it's, it's a elephant uh, ears you know it's it's like the equivalent of thinking hippos are cute and hippos then you find out that the they responsible for the most human deaths actually hippos are the most dangerous animals yeah and we always thought hippodams because you know whatever you see in comics yeah. it gets on into your into your mm-hmm. psyche and you feel ki hippos are mm-hmm. but when you read about it they've got as you rightly say the maximum human deaths have been caused in the nile region you know because of hippos have you had any operations near africa or like we have uh, not me but my our teams have gone to somalia those days uh not otherwise any other place okay see uh, india is not uh, a country which is given to you know participating in all kind of expeditionary warfare or we don't even side with any other country we only work when there's a un mandate without un mandate we don't form uh, we do not co- uh, cooperate with any other country for doing any operation have you been in hand to hand combat situations i have not been to hand to hand but i have caught a terrorist who just bit a cyanide in my hand when i was holding him and uh, for the first time in my life you know the ltd guys they have a uh, cyanide capsule hanging in the neck so he was being winched down from the helicopter and i was with my ak47 and the the moment he uh, bit the cyanide i realized he is also ltd he did not uh, that time he must have escaped how long does it take to kick in about 45 seconds and he just fell down a 6 foot guy handsome guy and muscular chap and he just like a fish out of water he reached for about 45 second some kind of froth came out one of my sailors who was a medical medic he actually tried to jump and give him mouth to mouth association i said what the hell is this why <laughs> he will also die. so i mean see what happens uh, people in the armed forces are not criminal minded people we are normal human beings we respect each other we fire at somebody because you know that if you don't fire at somebody he's going to kill you so but when you see a person lying like this he's unarmed and this like the, the tendency for you is to help him so i guess that is the reason which drove the sailor to try to help him but of course better sense prevailed and we were there and we pulled him out that was my first encounter with death i have never seen before that how old were you i was just about 28 28-29, just out of my Marine Commando course. Perhaps if I had not done my Marine Commando course, I would have been shattered actually. 
but after you do a marine commando course they they simulate situations where they take you in near death situation you know in the training itself so you get more hardened are you comfortable sharing what the near death situation in is? the sense that uh, there is something called as a hell week which they do uh, they you know they make you float and with your hands and legs tied one part of uh, the training not the hell week hell week is i mean if you can google it you can find out what is hell week it's actually 96 hours of non stop no sleep uh, physical regime 96, 96 hours, hours. you don't sleep for not a wink also they don't give you only one two hours in the morning to go shave and do your morning routines and wear a new dang green come and again continue with the training lifting up logs and swimming long distance swimming firing doing obstacle course and this continues for 96 hours without a breather you only get food thrice in a day do you, you get not, plenty of water do you not hallucinate uh see it doesn't happen in the initial part of the course it happens somewhere in the mid or the end part of the course so by which time the people got used to it human body is very malleable you know we can actually and everything is mental you know you need to have a, a, a basic uh, you know uh, level of physical fitness thereafter it's all mental so you, there are people who get hallucinate there are people and they give up also but i've not seen very many people giving up in the marine commando at least why didn't you give up i didn't give up because i didn't have the feeling of giving up <laughs> <laughs> you were just in a flow and you know in our uh, hell week was not that organized so i guess the hell week which happens now is much more stringent we were having i would say the casual version of the hell week we had a different hell week 18 hours of diving underwater that is dangerous actually it is it is it's actually uh, dangerous for the body but it saps you one hour of diving is equal to 8 hours of physical labor on uh, on surface yeah so that's it saps you but then you know, the body they with the so much of training you do you get used to this thing and let me also tell you the people who volunteer for this course have decided that we will do this they have visualized what they want to become and and, and so also a glamour factor for youngsters no there is a lot of glamour factor attached to it you will do sky diving you will do paratrooping you will do karate you will fire with weapons and all we used to roll and fire and you know roll back and fire pistol and all then we have something called as room intervention drill i'm just giving a random sure, sort of training So room intervention is basically you are simulating a situation where how do you uh, do hostage rescue? So there, there, there are mud walls. They made mud uh, for seven, eight rooms. They made a very complicated structure with the first floor and all, and they put cutouts of two heads. You know, uh, one is red, one is green. Now they give you twelve seconds. You do, you a buddy. Uh, you have to go inside with a, with six uh, commandos and the six buddies. Means total twelve, and you have to sanitize each and everything in a matter of twelve to fourteen seconds. so you have to get inside kick the door open see the target and you have to hit and both the shots because the calculation is that in 4 second you have to hit two shots because when people get startled they remain startled for 4 seconds after that they get the sense and then they can react so within that period of 4 second you have to fire two shots and we have trained to such a level that both the shot has to be head shot that means the green and red cut out there should not be any uh, holes in the green you will fail and here the pass percentage is 95% shooting and you have cross shootings and all you know people shooting from there you shooting from there it's, it's a situation where if if you do a mistake probably some guy can actually have collateral damage even in training even in training and then you have night exercises actually when you do slithering grappling when you do paragliding you know, they are all high risk activities you're diving underwater at night you're diving underwater and uh, so the animals you talked about so many of them are dangerous it becomes more dangerous it becomes more night. dangerous but you know the funny part is the best part is when you're doing training you don't feel like this you never feel an element of risk or apprehension you feel like every... why because you have faith on the way the training has been conducted number one number two we have tremendous amount of faith on the instructors because they are very well trained number three you have actually a lot of confidence self confidence on yourself and number four on your body this four combination is a very deadly and potent combination it holds you in very good stead you mentioned that if you hadn't gone through hell week you wouldn't have been able to deal with death in the sense that uh, not only the hell week the entire course it actually you see they are all building blocks they all building blocks so once uh, those things happen then you know that uh, amongst the armed forces people you are a niche and elite force your cutting edge has to be maintained you will be the first to go in and may not be the first to come out so you have that kind of aura in you you know so then you psych yourself mentally that look i am the best and uh, i the government of india expects a lot of things from me as they may not be expecting from other people mm. so the aspect of being fearful being scared is actually redundant it doesn't come only in any case if you are fearful it is a good emotion because if you are fearful then 
then you be, uh, start planning and you know thinking in a, in a more analyzing the thing much better and that helps in uh, safety and security of you and your uh, people um while i have countless more questions uh, there's some questions i'm saving for our hindi episode as well okay but before we begin that one sir i have one last phase of this particular episode okay. which is uh, related to 2611 okay um you know it's a topic that the english audiences have wondered more about since yeah. we did an episode with dishivanandan yeah uh, who was actually the strategist post 2611 and he made mumbai a safer place now you were involved in that operation in some capacity while it was happening are you comfortable narrating aspects of it through your own that i can do because it's an operation which is open domain so i can actually do on uh, in october 28th october we came to bombay i was uh, i got a, a, a prestigious appointment as a director of staff in naval war college now director of staff is like you are a teacher in a war college and the naval war college there are captains who are captain means uh, naval captains equal to army colonels they are all about 42 43 years old guys bubbling with energy and intelligence level is high and you are now trying to manage them as an instructor so it's a, it's a prestigious appointment and uh, co located uh, to our war college was the uh, the biggest marine commando unit in the indian navy so next month november this thing happened so when uh, uh, when uh, what happens you know the, any marine commando unit any armed force unit has got something called a qrt quick reaction team which is standby marine commandos have got uh, a few uh, elements called the prahars which are always ready to move in half an hour for any to meet any contingency so they had about a couple of people who were ready at any point in time that day on 26th 28th was november was a birthday on 26th uh, we suddenly switched on the tv at around 9 o'clock we found there some something happening in taj and something happened in sayan hospital and also in the in the vt station vt station i think yeah, vt station so uh, people thought it could be a gang war or some kind of things but uh, later on as things uh, unfolded they realized that it is a bit more than the gang war what was your first gut feeling my gut feeling was that we should be ready and uh, uh, and and, uh, and deploy at around uh, 11:30 or 12 we were told that uh, and now guys were there they saw they they all guys came to the unit and you surprisingly some, uh, some retired marine commando sailors also stay in the same area they all reported to the unit ke sir now we've just been out for one year we are still in date we can do firing and all if there is any requirement we are available civilians marine ex marine commando civilians imagine the imagine the josh and the enthusiasm anyway we wouldn't have taken them but they were there then our teams were mobilized without knowing head and tail of what is happening at around 12:30 at night they reached mumbai and taj there was a lot of chaos there and the team were told to enter so teams entered they entered and you know the ground floor of the uh, taj was all chaos mayhem lot of people dead you know all those people you see in pastry and all those kind of people lying dead some people actually very seriously injured and all so it startles people you know young marcos who have never been to a five star because you can't afford to go to a five star like this never you don't even know the layout of the place you don't know anything about that place you don't even know what the situation uh, how is the situation evolving but you just went because you were told to go because it was it became like a uh, you know situation critical so you have to do something the other people are not coming inside because obviously you know they are not trained for it so our guys went inside and uh, they started clearing every each and every room so they were able to uh, uh, save a lot of people and escort them back the people who were dead were lying there because there's no point because you can actually you know you have to see who is the people who can be actually you know retrieved and they can still live and like that they went i think in couple of uh, third, third or fourth floor at night they were trying to then the good part is the taj hotel staff were very brave they were accompanying the marine commando units and later on also the nsg they were very helpful they were not scared but they knew the layout so they were they were with these teams so they went to they were told that in the in the conference room there is uh, there is some report of, of some terrorist and uh, so these guys went and uh, outside there was light inside was dark so they opened the door the moment you opened the door the light from outside went inside so uh, unknowingly to them there were three or four terrorists inside the room they had done initial killing initially thereafter they were trying to recuperate before they start the next phase of operation so they suddenly found somebody coming inside and the moment 
one of my uh, uh, the commando sailor went inside and if see we there's a drill by which you go inside so we had we follow a buddy pair so one guy went inside second guy was outside and the other five six people are lined up behind he heard a cocking of ak47 and he realized ki now they are under grief because there is somebody is cocking ak47 we were using mp5s so there's a distinct noise of mp5 cocking and ak47 cocking and then there was a volley of fire from the other side and this guy got hit somewhere in his uh, this uh, this part and also in his clavicle fortunately not fatal and he just slumped down when that happened the other guys told not to come inside the room because then it have been problem because now they are in a advantageous position they can see because there is light behind you and they can actually take a pot shot so they all went out this guy was lying down he took out a grenade and chucked it grenade at the terrorist and the grenade did not burst now the hotel staff told ki this is the only exit from this room so these guys actually laid a you know position themselves so that when the terrorists come out of the room they will be shot but they did not know and also the staff did not know that there is another exit from behind wow. so those three four terrorists were there and see when he fired with the terrorist fired this guy also got hit he also fired and then the second buddy who was he also fired so but these are all aimless firing you know because at night you can't see anything and it was aimless and now you see you only wear a night side when there we are on in a dark atmosphere if you are working in a hotel where the lights are on you can't wear a night side because it will actually uh, the image intensified tube of the night side will get spoiled your eyes will also get damaged so they were not wearing a night side at that point in time as they entered the room so this guy fell down and everyone fired they also fired as a volley of fire then there was firing stopped these guys jumped out and went somewhere else then one of the guys came and chucked a, even the terrorist they chucked a chinese grenade and that also didn't burst now imagine if the grenade had burst then all the terrorists would have been dead but this guy also would have been dead but in the heat of the moment it happened then he was pulled out now what has happened is that the terrorists encountered a special force which they were not expecting because as thing turned out later on extensive planning was done by mr healy uh, headley and all those people they would have done the recce of the entire area. they would have known that energy actually is in manesar delhi it will take x amount of time for them to come to bombay and then and bombay traffic and all those things and you know is priority given or not all these are issues which are linked up issues so they would have easily got a breather of 4 to 5 hours from the time they actually start uh, doing the killing till the time the terrorists can actually uh, the force can be brought to bear upon them that was uh, maybe in their mind and secondly this was not a anti terrorist it was not a hostage situation it was like a war because they had come to kill only they mm-hmm. knew that they'll perish so they were just killing left right and center but when the marcos entered and the fire fight took place that was the first fire fight so these guys jumped out the guy who was hurt he left his uh, weapon in his pack and jumped out so this pack and weapon was recovered then they realized ki it is it, it is not uh, gang uh, gang warfare any, any longer it is actually a terrorist operation and then they read the entire thing it is pakistani things so then the situation totally changed now meanwhile the other you uh, know reinforcement of marine commandos came from the unit and they became so four prahas means uh, 32 people entered taj and 16 people entered uh, trident also overall trident and they they started searching room to room the terrorist who were the other the hunters became the hunted so almost the killing stopped now they were running for the life because they realized ki now they are i mean they do not know how many people they the moment you have a firefight with a force with wearing black dress and all these helmets and all they would have seen it they would realize ki now they are cornered and it is not one two it may be 30 40 100 for all you know so then they started running thereafter it is recorded that uh, the killing actually stopped so the the marine commandos intervention at that point in time helped in disrupting the timelines what they would have set in for themselves and like that they operated till this this encounter took place at 3 4 in the morning means on 27 uh, early morning then they continued working and by 9:30 10 uh, they had almost cleared almost everyone was cleared they had rescued about 160 odd people the marine commando of the small force of about 16 or 32 had rescued about 150 150 or 160 people and i when i say rescue me they were helped by the uh, by the staff of uh, the taj and i think kudos to the staff of the taj hotel they were very brave and they all got them out then next day morning the nsg came and see nsg this is the core uh, area of the nsg so this is this kind of operation is the core uh, you know uh, area of the nsg and just a word about nsg nsg stands for national security guards so they come under ministry of home affairs nsg has got uh, basically two elements 
and one is the special uh, rangers group and one is the special action group so special rangers group comprises of people from the paramilitary forces and they look after a lot of other things including the vip security they look after but the core fighting is done by the special action group which is purely 100% armed forces people and uh, they do a training of 3 4 months is a very rigorous training and then they are on deputation for 3 to 4 years when they do this anti terrorist operation and the hijacking operations so there are two elements within uh, within uh, the special action group it is called sag 51 sag 51 which is anti terrorist operations and sag 52 which is anti hijacking operations so anti hijacking operation is the one of the most complicated operations amongst all special operations so the force which came there was uh, from sag 51 they came and they landed early in the morning then by bst buses they came to the area of uh, the area where the event was happening and thereafter they uh, pressed into operation they took about 1 2 hours for getting the gen uh, general information about and the orientation from the marine commandos would spend the whole night there and for some time even the marine commandos uh, along with the uh, the security staff of the hotel they helped them out and once the nsg the nsg is a very trained force it's is is a is one of the best trained force we have in our country or maybe in the world and they did the operation in quick time did you end up going to the locations of the incidents after it happened uh after it happened uh, once i went and visited but see the, what happened that uh, the role of the marine commandos uh, was not known to many people so when uh, barack obama he came to india uh, following this uh, thing i think next day he came and he because he gets a huge security entourage from his own country and he also get his own aircraft as well as also the helicopter called the marine one so he landed in sar and the government of india didn't allow them to use weapons so government of india said ki we will give you all support any other forces can come they said we want only marine commandos so you will be surprised to know that the only force selected in india by the government of india and by the us was marine command they had so much of faith after this operation because the new reality mm. and uh, so you have pictures of you know uh, the helicopter landing in uh, one of the naval bases which is very close to in, in, inside kolaba marine one came and barack obama coming out and all in the very inner security circle the marine commandos mm. it is an it is a, a something which doesn't happen because when the us president is there for about 2 3 km the whole area sanitized they don't find any other person yeah. but as an exception he al- they allowed and agreed to have marine commandos as the inner security cordon which is a great thing yeah. that's number 1 number 2 then they uh, they went to taj and uh, the first lady michelle obama she wanted to meet a couple of people who participated in the operation and among the naval people she wanted to meet the marine commandos so what i'm trying to say is that these people just don't call at people at random they do a lot of thorough research so they would have got to know exactly uh, who are the people see now uh, i'm not saying that uh, we uh, the marine commandos i would say we because i'm part of the marine commandos i'm i'm not saying that i was the one who did the operation and you know nobody gave us the accolades no i'm not saying that i'm saying that uh, it's a teamwork and a lot of people work together but how much people worked who organized it that is an issue here. the people who have got keen eye and who are initiated into special operation will actually know and secondly like a heart attack or any other uh, medical calamity emergency there is something called as the golden period so like if you got a heart issue within 1 2 hours if you are able to take a person to the hospital and under med- effective medical care you can save the person same thing happens in terrorist operation also the first 2 3 hours are very crucial if you are able to at that 2 3 hours if you are able to enter and encounter the force the uh, the the terrorists then they become the defensive then the gravity of the damage is limited and restrained yeah so that is the job i think the marine commandos did of course there are other people who also worked uh, alongside with there were anti terrorist uh, squad of the mumbai police also came but then they were not equipped for this kind of heavy heavy duty operation so they they accompanied there after they pulled out and the the staff of the taj was always there then the army was caught out and later on the nsg came and nsg are masters in this yeah. they did a fantastic job yeah you know so from an international perspective a lot of people all over the world know about navy seals just because of how much navy seals are out there and i'm talking about the american version of marine commandos i think it's about time the world gets to know about the greatness of indian marine commandos or the marcos and that's a huge reason for us even wanting to do this particular episode 
No, for that, I'm very thankful to you because by this medium, we got a huge reach, four five million people, and I'm sure that people will now get to know a little bit more, a wee bit more about what Navy is all about and what Marine Command is all about. Yes, sir, and it's just the beginning, honestly. Yeah. Like I feel generally, the Indian population is very inclined towards learning about the armed forces, but we've not got a correct medium. Okay. So through this series, we've done on military podcasts. I've got to learn so much. It's genuine questions I have with a little bit of animal danger and all that added in, <laughs> but uh, it's genuinely like an honor. Even Even like listening to you, learning to you—not just you or any armed forces veteran. I think of all the podcasts that I do, uh, you all have the most uh, wide life in terms of experiences, in terms of going to the depth of life, in terms of coming that close to that level of danger. These kind of perspectives are not there in other professions, sir. Yeah, actually, it's good. Nice that you feel like that about uh, the armed forces per se. But if you ask me very frankly. Every profession has got its own high points and low points. Every profession has its own risk. What is what is the risk for you? What is the risk for the people who work in a company or a multinational or a startup? Their risk factors are different. Visa vis what risk factor which people in the armed forces do. So while what you say, I totally agree and second it also. But I must also give due to the people who are working. Everybody is working to build a country. So my, this is my personal views. Yeah. Now since you mentioned about Marine Commando, I thought I must just tell you how Marine Commando is different from other special forces in India. Sure. we are actually uh, based on the us navy seal pattern so training pattern is like them so uh, our training is the most elaborate and the longest training everybody has to be a clearance diver or a diver who is a combat diver everybody has to handle you uh, know ieds and other things then everybody has to be a land lubber means a commando on land then everybody has to be trained in uh, airborne insertion so this elaborate training doesn't happen in any special force in our country So that's number and why this kind of high high intensity training is because of the simple fact that you are working in three mediums largely two medium the land and the sea and the sea is very unforgiving so you have to be that you have to train that much more so that's that's sort of thing which and and because of this and the multifaceted tasking which can come because of the kind of training and skills sets you have actually developed and consolidated over a period of time and been given to you by a uh, able instructors uh, your domain of operation is far Mm. and wider and that's why the equipment level which you got is far more superior than the equipment level which any other special force has in the country to my knowledge yeah. and my knowledge is very current because i i left uh, my last seat as principal director special operation after 8 years in november 2020 wow. okay you know so, wh- while while i want to dig 10 more tangents just out of this one paragraph that you've given us so i have to save content for the hindi episode as well <laughs> <laughs> that's the honest answer I would also like to say it's easily one of the best podcasts I've ever had in my life, and you have that much to share. That's how wide your experiences are, sir. Thanks a lot. You think like that? Yeah, no, no. And collectively, as a team, we're like deeply grateful. Uh, thank you for your service on behalf of like the entire country and the youth. I know I can speak for them, so. But uh, one thing I would definitely like to say is the internet needs more of the armed forces, and this is this just this episode is one huge step in that direction. People need to know. what kind of bad asses the indian armed forces really are and it's just the beginning that's <laughs> thanks a lot say. and it's my pleasure being in this show and through this medium uh, a lot of people can be educated and obviously the awareness you know even the us had the same problem there is something called a sea blindness the us people don't know what is the us navy doing with they are deployed uh, around the world so they had a serial called uh, the Pat- the patriot which is shot on board nimitz the entire uh, tv crew came on board nimitz or not nimitz some one of the aircraft carriers nuclear power aircraft carriers and they stayed on board for 6 months and shot what actually operations happen and how a daily life is on board a aircraft carrier just to make people realize that don't, uh, don't what navy is all about and if the us navy the people don't know about us navy in their own country you can imagine what happens in other countries yeah. so this your effort is uh, a very honest and sincere effort towards educating the people about a lot of aspects and there are wide aspects uh, in the armed forces and of course the marine commandos are not only marine commandos other special forces are the best i would say yeah and i'll continue to say that <laughs> so pardon me for not standing but i salute you like from the bottom <laughs> of my heart thank, like thanks a lot just thanks thank lot. you for opening up so much on uh, this episode lots more episodes to create with you <laughs> that's what i'll say okay thank you sir we can do this yes of course thank <laughs> yeah honor speaking with you sir thank you my pleasure my honor too that was the episode for today the thing i love about special forces podcasts are that when i speak to special forces veterans 
I realized that this is the true meaning of life. Exploration, perspectives, coming this close to danger, coming this close to death, coming this close to people and situations that are built to kill you and surviving through it and growing after your survival and changing your own perspectives after that growth, that survival. I hope that we're able to capture the essence of being a Special Forces veteran through these episodes. Commodore Vijay Rawat is a legend from the world of the Special Forces. I hope that the Indian youth especially gets to know the amount of badassery that we have within the armed forces even today. People need to know how capable the Indian armed forces are. People need to know the greatness of the Indian armed forces. It begins with these special forces conversations that we do on the podcast. But I promise you there's a whole world left to discover. Make sure you follow our Hindi podcast as well where we actually created a Hindi episode with Vijay sir right after this one. Both the highlights channels are live on YouTube. They contain only the best bits of both the episodes. We're going to be linking them down below. And make sure you keep following TRS on Spotify. For Spotify exclusive, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Vijay sir will be back on TRS. And this is just the beginning of all these Special Forces podcasts that we'll be bringing your way.